Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to KW Property Management Consulting's Best Practices for Community Associations. Uh, my name is Tim O'Keefe. We're going to continue our discussion that we started last week, these once a month, but last week was such a uh, hot topic and great topic talking about budget season and the impact that many of you are facing relative to uh, preparing for the SERS uh, funding, uh, insurance, uh, in addition to just costs going up for repairs and maintenance and salaries that uh, we felt like it would be worthwhile to come back again this week and finish up on what we started last week. So once again, I'd like to introduce our uh, esteemed panelists that we have that are most knowledgeable and make this session a little bit fun for all of us. So uh, first, welcome back, Nicole Johnson Pendergrass. Nicole's the Director of Operations for Hafer Certified Public Accountants. You all know uh, Nicole from last week. So Nicole, welcome back. You probably didn't think you're going to be doing this so soon again. I'm excited to be back. I think we need a little more information from last week to add to that. So I appreciate you having me back. And if anybody wonders whether or not this is really a new week, just look at Nicole's glasses this week. It's different <laughs> from last week. Definitely different. <laughs> Uh, and then also I want to welcome back Roxana Dorigo, who's an executive yeah. director and partner with KW. Roxana is a CPA. She runs all of our back office accounting work for our clients and is most knowledgeable about budgets. She gets involved in many, many budgets every year. And I call her the board whisperer because when people don't know and don't understand how this all works or gets upset about budgeting, Roxana knows how to calm you down. So <laughs> welcome back, Roxana, and thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, my favorite topic, and definitely yeah. there's a lot more to talk about. So yeah. and I, I, would be, I would be remiss if we didn't start by at least acknowledging that we do have a catastrophic hurricane that came on shore this morning uh, in the Big Bend in Florida. So for those that are impacted, we certainly uh, feel sympathetic toward you. Uh, we, we all feel blessed that it didn't hit us, but we're sorry that it had to come in someplace and that it, it may have affected some of you. Hopefully you're not listening to this budget that you're probably busy taking care of things or maybe without power, but we want to acknowledge that we recognize uh, some of the challenges you're going to be going through and we are certainly uh, very mindful of that and wish you the best. So with that, we'll start into budget. I, so I want to pick up a little bit where we left off last week. And Nicole, I'm going to ask you the first question because we're going to talk today about uh, timing of budgeting, when you have to fund the, the Structural Integrity Reserve Study. We're also going to talk about insurance today. We didn't have time last week to do that. So we're going to discuss the increases in insurance. And Roxana just came out of a meeting relative to insurance costs going up and what one of the uh, big brokers in, in the state of Florida is providing guidance on. So with that, um, Nicole, for you, when are associations required to begin funding for the Structural Integrity Reserve Study? And I'm going to ask you two parts. One is if you have a, a fiscal year end of December versus a non-December fiscal year end. So let's start with a December fiscal year end and what are the requirements for starting to fund for SERS? So I think there's some misperception. It's not maybe some miscommunication. It's not that it's being said improperly. Is that when they changed in the glitch bill saying that any association that adopts their budget on or after December 31st, 2024. It's not saying that the Sears isn't required to be funded. What's stating is it would be in your 2025 budget, you would still have the Sears reserves, but the association membership is still able to waive and partially fund that Sears. The 2026 budget is when they're not going to be able to do that. So the Sears funding is still going to be required in the 2025 budget with the non-structural reserves, but you're only able to not, um, not partially fund or waive it in the 26 budget. So I think there's miscommunication. People think in that the 25 budget, they don't even have to include the Sears. It's still going to be included in the budgeting, but you can still partially fund or waive those Sears. Okay. And so what happens if you have a fiscal year end that's, let's say, March or July? How does that change if your fiscal year starts June of 2026, let's say? When would you start funding? From what I'm reading in the statute from an accounting standpoint is they're going to be a year earlier because they're going to be adopting their budgets prior to that. So I believe that they're going to be in their 25 25 26 budget, they're going to be required to fully fund and not be able to waive or partially fund that. 
Okay. But in all of this, just a point of recommendation, don't think of the waving because I think you're just making the matters worse as time goes by. So the way we approached it at KW is that when the, the statute passed is that, oh, we only have two years. That That's what we were thinking. We only have two years to step up the reserve contribution level to what it's going to be. So little by little to do so, instead of doing it a one-time 2025, now you have your reserve contribution, not 10 or 20%, but rather potentially 40 or 50% increase. So we're, we're trying to use our time to step up to what potentially will be. I think that's a great point. I think just because the statute's still allowing you to waive it or partially fund it, you shouldn't be pushing it down the road because you want to make sure you're transparent to the owners. And if you're breaking it up over those two years, you're going to help those unit owners be able to afford that. So I think that extension of allowing to do that gives you time to, like Roxana said, fund it over those two years. And so if you if you're still allowed to waive reserves. What what are the new their new requirements around the waiving? You have to get more people involved. So can you talk about that a bit, Nicole? Like what does it take to waive reserves? Correct. So now it is required. It's the majority of the membership. So it's not a majority of the quorum in a meeting. It's a majority of the membership. So it's going to take a lot more for you to be able to do that. I think owners realizing that too are going to start to say, well, why did that change? And then they're also going to look at it and say, well, maybe we shouldn't be waiving these. Let's find out more what's going on. Let's look at those reserve studies, especially because of the tragic Surfside event. I think more of your associations have gotten more involved. I know the budget meetings I've attended, more unit owners are asking asking questions, more one are wanting to see the milestone, the Sears reports and saying, okay, where do we need to be at? Because they don't want to be in a situation what happened down there. So um, I think more owners are getting involved and the more transparency, the better. Yes. Okay. Um, and Roxana, I'm going to ask you this question, but you both are going to uh, contribute on this for sure. Um, this question gets asked often to us, can reserve money be used? Can you fund reserves through your operating expenses? Can you or can you borrow from reserves to pay for operating? Is that allowed? No. Uh, <laughs> so our guide is usually a reserve study. And one of the great things, although maybe many don't still see it, is that the reserve study, the structural reserve study is also going to add another layer of information, resource to kind of pinpoint what is my game plan? What are the items that I can use reserves for? So it's very specifically defined in the statute what can be reserved, uh, what can uh, be, uh, what items we can use reserve funds for. And I always point to the reserve study. I always go to that and I look through the items to make sure that it's in there. And then I go into the reserve study by section because it does, well, does it mean this or that or that road or this road? And it does really specifically define what the reserve studies uh, uh, funds are for. So if reserve funds are used for operating, we're talking about repairs like a pipe broke or uh, there's a pothole in, in the pavement um, in a parking lot, that is repairs. And if we're using reserves, um, that would be using restricted funds for operating purposes. So there would be a uh, amount due from the reserve, from the operating to the reserves. So you're, you're literally borrowing money that you cannot touch. So, um, and Nicole, you, you do a lot of audits every year. So I'm sure that's something that you look at in the audit process, because I've actually been surprised this year at the number of properties that we've had discussions with um, that may be self-managed or might be with other management companies. And they're using their reserve funds to fund operating because they've had shortfalls due to other increases like from insurance. And so they're borrowing. So how do you approach that from an audit perspective when you go in and look at a property and you start looking for do to do froms? So associations don't like our comments in the audit. So it'll say that this is a potential violation of statutes. And the reason we use that is because we're not attorneys, that we can't practice law. So we say it is a potential violation. Um, as Roxana said, 
it is not allowed by statutes to use reserve money for operating. Now, in the past, for the non-structural reserves, it was allowed to get a membership vote to do that. However, we always say to our associations that is not recommended. Those reserves are there for capital items. Um, they're not there for an emergency situation. That should be built into your budget. You should be building in a contingency or a hurricane deductible for those things that come up. Those reserves are set aside for the replacement of those capital items. So even though the statutes allows you for that one-time membership vote to do that, we don't recommend that. Now, in future, the SEERS, the structural integrity, you won't be able to do that. You will not be able to get the membership vote to use it for other purposes, which I'm glad they put that in there because now if they do, it is a violation and they could be where they turn into the state and they could be fine for that. So they always want to make sure that you put in your budget for those unexpected items so the capital does not get touched. So people might have reserves for non-paragraph G items or non-SERS items. Let's say you put money aside for uh, a, a lobby replacement or replacing carpeting. That might be a good example. So can you talk a little bit, Nicole, about what are properties doing? Can you shift those dollars away from non-paragraph non G items and put it, move it into paragraph G so that you've got funds set aside and you might deplete what you had on the non-SERS issues, but can you talk about the options that are available to boards today re regarding that issue? Sure. So here's some of the complications that are going to come with that, especially if the association's non-structural right now, all their reserves, um, are in the pooling method because the polling method does not segregate out which money goes to which line item. So the boards are gonna to have to sit down with the reserve companies, the attorneys, and look through that and say, what are we gonna determine an allocation for the funds that are gonna go into the new Sears? So because they're pooled, there's not something that's designated for roof that they can say, well, we'll move that roof money to the new Sears roof. So they're gonna to have to sit down and come up with some type of allocation to move money right now in their total pooled reserves that include non-structural because it's not broken out. The other side to that is, and it's it's been a question to many attorneys that the attorneys are gonna have to address this is, will it require a membership vote to move money from a pooled reserve right now that includes non-structural to a new pooled, which is the structural, because there's different components in each and they're not exactly the same. So when the money gets moved over, the original pool was for other purposes, and now the new pool is for different purposes. So they're going to have to clarify either in legislation or from an attorney's perspective, does that require a membership vote? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Roxana, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, that's a good point because we saw the structural components, the ones that have been defined. When you look at the list, you could identify like three or four that have been in reserve studies historically, like waterproofing, roof. You know, these are items that are in the pool. So how do you extract that on what basis? I, I naturally go to, oh, well, as a weighted average of the replacement costs. But then there's arguments to that, many that I could even uh, poke holes to that thought because what if you just replace the, the roof? So why would you do it on the replacement cost when you just funded and now you have 25 years to still fund the rest? So yes, I, I agree. There's a lot of confusion and still kind of pending on um, guidance on that to really clarify and make it standard, right, for all associations. So. I think the easiest ones will be the ones that are in the component method, mm -hmm. moving to a Sears. Exactly. Component. I was thinking no the problem. same thing. <laughs> the straight line, not a problem. You know exactly Easy. what you have there. You know exactly what you used. And as we talked before, the way it was worded in the original bill, you immediately thought, oh, it's straight line. We're going to be doing straight line, right? And that would have clarified a few things. <laughs> yes. But uh, we're back in the pooling, which is a benefit to the association. So the pooling method is, you know, going to be allowed. But then it's the uh, just question of the allocation. Can you clarify um, the difference so that everybody understands the difference between straight line versus pooled and why there was a belief that uh, the original language in SB4, people thought that you had to straight line for SERS uh, funding, but that not the case, correct? So I, Nicole, do you want to address that first? 
Sure. So when it originally came out, they had it line by line. So they line item it out and said that each of the monies that were being separated for the Sears was designated for those line items. So everybody that was looking at that said, well, this is the component method because the component method of reserves, you're going to designate money to each line item and it can only be used for that line item. So they had to come out and clarify saying, well, can it still be pooled even though you're using it for all those line items? And they have clarified that, that it can be in the pooling method. But the original language, everybody across the board, management companies, accountants, attorneys were saying it was component method originally. So Jackie's asking a clarification question. And for those of you listening, feel free to use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to send questions. Although we have plenty of questions from last week and uh, in preparation for today, I got a lot of questions. But Jackie's asking, even if you pool reserves, don't you have to compute what each item is worth? And couldn't that figure be used to switch to the SERS reserves? Um, it, it's the question maybe we still have to know the replacement costs. We still need to know the useful life and the remaining useful life of that component. Absolutely. So uh, from that perspective, all of that work still has to be done by a specialist. Uh, and that has even been clarified. It was a licensed um, architect or engineer. Now it is a firm that has the guidance from a licensed engineer or architect. Architect. Correct. And I think one of the questions she's at, like when you're um, responding to that too, is yes, it's still going to show all the components and what the values are, but it's not going to be calculated the same based on what is like the estimated cost divided by the number of years. This is what's in that line item. So the pulling schedule is very different. It goes over a 30 year or 20 year longest life of your asset, showing when that expense comes due. Okay, so that uh, helps provide some clarification on uh, in, in understanding the difference between the straight line and the uh, pooled, because I know everybody was thinking that straight line was going to be the way to go for SERS, but we're saying that is absolutely not going to be the case. Um, this is a little bit different kind of question, but Don in West Palm Beach wanted to know, uh, this is just more of a budgeting issue. Should the income from capital contributions be in operating or reserves? So, you guys like this question. Great I can question. Ask, yeah. Donna, thank you for asking that question. Yeah. A good question. Yeah, yeah it's a good question. At the same time, like Christmas trees, that's a great question. So <laughs> this is what's happened and what I've seen over the 15 years. Capital contributions from an accounting perspective, is part of the operating fund. So what is a capital contribution? What constitutes so capital contribution can be obtained when there is a transfer of title, when there's a sale of a unit or home, and the governing documents allow you to collect a month or two as I, I see it as working capital. Right. So in it's more common in the developer stage when the developer controls an association on the initial sale of a unit in the documents, the developer collects one or two months of capital contribution, which is working capital. And the idea behind it is that when the developer no longer manages and controls the association, but the owners while they turn over the, the management of the association to the owners, there's a time, about a month or two, that they need to reorganize in order to uh, manage the association. And so during that time, there may be uh, readjustment of budgets, et cetera. And thus the working capital is technically for that period of time, but it is operating funds. However, some boards have used the opportunity to board designate those funds for specific things like capital improvements. So I've seen that as well, where they designate anything that is received into this capital contribution pot of funds to be used only for capital improvements. Or in some cases, I've also seen them allocate that to reserves. And it would be part of how they pass their operating budget. So they will have a certain, you know, fully funded contribution amount for reserves that can be subsidized by this capital contribution amount. 
being collected from um, sales, title transfers. It's a great point. Also, a few things. Um, it has to be in your documents, like Roxana said, and this all pertains to 720. 718 does not allow for capital contributions. They're very strict on that. They might have in like a, um, you know, like an application fee, but they can't have capital contributions like 720 is allowed. And from an outside standpoint, you're going to shut sometimes internally, they show it as revenue, like from a um, monthly standpoint, like on your monthly financials, but externally, when you get your audit report, it's really equity. So you won't see it up in the income section. If you budgeted for it, it'll be below the line in the equity section. That's the other question. The second part of the question from Donna is, does the activity show up as an, on the income statement or the balance sheet? So it'll be on the income state bottom line equity. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and Stuart's asking, does interest on investments in your reserves have to be prorated to each reserve category or may it remain in its own reserve category until an allocation to a specific reserve account is needed? So, so for pooling, Roxana, maybe that's the easier one. Right Smile yeah. first, Roxana, you get that one. You go right Yeah, in. so the, the pooling, it's easy, right? It goes into a pool fund and it can be used for any one of the pooled reserve components. While the reserve, when it's calculated by component, we've allocated it based on the weighted average of replacement costs at that point, because you do have to find a basis by which do you how do you allocate the interest that's being earned on all reserve funds? What do you think, Nicole? I completely agree with you. You're allowed to have it in a line item called unallocated interest, but most of my associations do it exactly like Roxana does, and they break it out to the component based on the weighted average. Okay, and then uh, Karen is asking, and Nicole, I'll ask you this question. Where do we stand on the issue of using borrowings and repayments on an existing line of credit to smooth reserve assessments to owners over a period of years. So I have an association, excellent association that we do. They have CPAs on the board. They have a great like 30 year plan and they use they use lines of credit and loans to do that, how they're going to fund those over a period of time. In the statutes, they haven't allowed for that. There hasn't been anything that said you can use funding to uh, do this for the seers. So there hasn't been anything saying we've reached out to the state. I've dealt with people on DPPR and asked about that. They said there's no clarification saying that because loans aren't really income. So to say that you're fully funding using loans when that's really debt, the state's not going to be okay with that. So there's nowhere in the statute that says that that's allowing that right now. I have an association that does it and they do a wonderful plan over 30 years and they use funding because it works for that association. But this new Sears reporting, there's nowhere stating that that's going to be allowed because it's debt and it's not income. So that's not really fully funding the Sears. A question on that association, Nicole, are they repaying the loan through the operating? Through the operating they're, budget? So they're doing it as a special assessment. Hmm. They're doing a separate special assessment. And then when they pay that back, then they, they do through assessments, paying that loan back. So they use funding, they use lines of credit to do the work. And then they do special assessments to pay that back. And it's worked for that association. They, they're actually in good financial shape, but yeah. nowhere in the, like you can say, nowhere in the statutes that's being allowed right now. Yeah. Yeah, I was okay. looking for clarification in May of 2023 no. for that, but it hasn't happened yet. No, so it hasn't. And we've asked a few people from DPBR and they're saying, well, it's not it's not really income. So for us, if we look at an audit and it's mm -hmm. debt, we're not going to see it as fully funding. Okay, we're going to shift gears a bit and talk about insurance because that's uh, another hot topic in today's market. Um, so Roxana, you're working on a lot of budgets right now. What is the guidance that we are recommending to boards as far as what kind of increase to expect in insurance? And what are we hearing from you know, the experts that are in the field today talking to us? The so number one is go to your own insurance agent and get their estimate. But if they're not able to give you the estimate quite yet, our recommending now this morning, literally, um, we partner up with a um, uh, 
insurance agent, USI, and they did a small presentation for us just to give us a little glimpse into what's happening into the industry. And they did make a mention that um, the best time to get estimates is November, which I thought was really a, a good point and interesting. And in our world, at least in KW's world, we try to approve uh, budgets by the beginning of November. And we do that for many reasons, one of which to allow owners time to adjust their own finances, especially in the last two years, because the income, um, what they recommended Roxanne, is somewhat about four or five between... seconds. You froze for just a few seconds. So. Oh, okay. So uh, I mentioned that, uh, I don't know if you captured this, that the, their recommendation is somewhere between 30 to 50% for next year. That is where they're seeing the numbers. And there's different reasons for that. But what I learned through this session in the morning, again, I, I, I rely on the insurance experts, but I have always heard when these increases occurred, it's the reinsurance market that's the problem. There's not a lot of competition. We're also a state that loves lawsuits. So there, you know, we we the insurance companies don't want to be in Florida. And also something else that I was learning this morning is that you may get an appraisal for your building and the, that may come back, let's say 150 per square foot for the value. But then the insurance companies are now saying, no, we don't agree. We want that at 200 square foot, the price. So they're also seeing that happening and it's because of the construction cost is specifically in South Florida. So that is also driving the increase in cost. And ultimately most, I would say like 95% of our associations finance their insurance. So the other uh, component to the increase is the financing charges, which have almost doubled from where we were maybe three years ago. Now, the, what used to be two to three, three and a half percent is somewhere between seven, seven and a quarter. So that's also consideration to the you know overall cost of insurance. Nicole, what when how do you all address it from an audit standpoint? Because I'm sure you're seeing you know numbers increase dramatically over the past year. Like a lot of a lot of properties we saw last year, I think across all of our clients, we saw a 33 percent increase roughly in insurance. But we had some that saw a 300 percent increase. We had one particular property went from $250,000 to over $800,000. And we had one that went from a million to 3 million. So, you know, it's not just the percentage of, gee, how much actual dollars is it going to cost? And how many units do we have in our condo? Then you divide that increase by the number of units and it becomes a pretty big number. Yeah. And, and from the audit perspective, Absolutely. The insurance is the highest cost we've seen that's gone up in all of our budgets, especially associations that are closer to the ocean that are older, um, like our Palm Beach location. A lot of our Palm Beach clients, they were averaging 80 to 90 percent increases the last two years. So a lot of them got together and said, you know, what can we do? Are other associations doing this? Um, are they having the same increases, which they are? Some of them went out and tried to do more of the work to see, okay, if we get a new roof, are we going to have better for insurance doing it sooner than waiting the 15 or 20 years? So they were trying to come up with solutions to help this insurance. And now, you know, with this catastrophic event today, who knows what the next year will be with the insurance also. So associations really need to be proactive in the sense of saying, educating the owners and saying, this is where we're going to be at. I mean, everybody, even their personal insurance has gone up. So we've seen an average with just all of our associations, self-insured included, probably 70% increase in insurance between self-managed um, associations and ones that are closer to the ocean. That's going to answer Karen's question because she said that are their agent estimated 70%. Does that sound reasonable? And you're saying that's not out of line. That's a lot of what she's you're right saying. on target. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the interesting thing that you mentioned, you know, some properties are self-managed, others are managed by uh, management companies. Nicole, what's your, like, what's the perspective that you have on those self-managed properties? Good. You look, I know it's, I'm biased in saying this and it's self-serving, but it feels to me like it's more and more challenging 
to remain self-managed these days because of these changing laws, keeping track of that, getting your reserve studies done effectively, and just the 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 liability on own on board members now because you can be it's much easier to be deemed negligent than it was in the past and maybe your dno insurance isn't going to stand behind and support you so just what's your general take uh, on the self-managed world and trying to remain self-managed versus working with a management company like kw Sure. And this is a hot topic I talk about a lot to my boards um, in the sense, the first thing is my board members are volunteer boards. They're not out there being paid. They shouldn't be doing full-time work. So a lot of times when they're in a self-managed community, they're working 40 to 50 hours as a board member. They're overseeing everything. They're overseeing the property manager. There's more risk. Um, they're the payroll. They have employees, higher risk. Um, are you abiding by all payroll laws, which is a lot. People don't realize how much there is involved in oversight of payroll um, and being in compliance with federal to make sure that you're doing everything with your employees. Also, from a DNO standpoint, the decisions are you making? Are you in compliance with statutes? Um, do you have the resources like a property management has, meaning regional directors, people that are educated, taking their CAMS licenses, taking the courses, having the background with all the professionals when a contract comes out? What do we need to do? Who needs to review it? There's so much more insight when you have an outside professional management company. And I'm talking the professional management companies that have the CPAs on staff that are in connection with all the professionals. There's so much more benefit to a board that is a volunteer board. And I talk about it all the time because a lot of mine that move from self-managed that were 30 years self-managed and they were you know, very set in their ways. And I understand it. They're used to it. They come down to the office, they sign the checks. They're comfortable with that, which they don't realize is the risk. They're signing checks. They're signing blank checks and leaving them in the office. How dangerous is that? Somebody comes in and breaks into your office. They're not doing electronic today. A lot of my board members too are, you know, is electronic safe? If they got comfortable, how much better and efficient it is to run it electronically and all the technology, they would get so comfortable and realize, wow, I'm only overseeing it. I'm only a board of governance overseeing the daily operations and not having to do all the work. I think a lot of them would switch. <laughs> I, I always make, we talked to a lot of self-managed buildings and I always ask them, what keeps you up at night, Mr. Board member? It's like, nothing, I sleep great. It's like, if you knew what you didn't know, you'd never sleep at night. That's always my response to them because there's there's so much that they they really are just not aware of. I mean, just because your property looks clean and it seems to run relatively well and you feel like you're maintaining your costs, it doesn't mean you're doing a good job. It really no, doesn't. and one of the like biggest ones that people fail to realize is example, health insurance. It changed when the Obamacare came out and you were never allowed to now reimburse an employee for health insurance. Most of my self-managed ones are giving checks to employees for health insurance. If that is caught, the fine is like a $35,000 fine for doing that. They don't realize the risk associated because they don't know all the news laws that came out. And as a board, they should just be overseeing. They shouldn't have to be always on top of everything for the association and rely on the professionals. Okay, well, thank you for uh, opining on uh, on the self-managed <laughs> side of things. It's a little bit self-serving, but uh, <laughs> nonetheless, it's, it's factual, it is factual. I'm going to come back to you, Roxanne, on this insurance question that Heidi was asking, um, which is what is being, uh, we talked about recommended for insurance, but there's, there's another part of this question, which is how do we, if we know that we're, we're going to have a shortfall being able to pay for insurance, how can we fund insurance through a financing plan? Because we do see, and like how many of our properties today finance insurance versus just pay it 100%? And what kind of change have we seen in the last year because of these increases? So there's a lot of questions to unpack there, but yeah. you can take it. So financing is normal, right? We do see that in 98% of our associations that they are financing probably more now than a few years. And we at KW, we try to get them options. That's the best uh, thing that we can do is uh, provide them options uh, versus a uh, financing company that finances premiums. That's what they do. Typically, insurance agents align themselves with uh, two or three big premium financing uh, contracts, but what uh, companies, but what we do is we also go to some of our 
partner banks, we deal with uh, banks that know associations and have actually created products for associations and funding insurance. So with time, we prepare a package so that the board has options. Um, I can't say that we're always competitive on interest, but at least we try. And sometimes we win. Sometimes, you know, one of the options is outside of the premium financing companies, and that would be a um, few thousand dollars savings to the association. So um, it, it's not uncommon to finance, obviously, insurance. And totally. another something else that I've noticed, obviously, a trend now that before you used to see one amended budget. Now I'm seeing a lot of amended budgets and it's because they we budgeted a certain percentage for insurance increases. But when the actual re renewal occurred, which was after passing the budget, the increase was quite a higher. So either you have a few choices, you have the choice of amending a budget, which is something that was not common. Now I'm seeing it more often. And then the other is a special assessment to fund the excess that was not in the operating budget. So Nicole, we've, I mean, I've gotten a lot of questions that are kind of wrapped around the same issue, which is what is the state doing to help control the rise of insurance costs? Are you, is there anything that you're seeing that, you know, I know that the state kind of came, the state legislature came out of session this year with, better guidance around what the service study requirements were, but they basically said, we're gonna tackle rising costs of insurance next year. I'm not really sure what that means. Do you have any insight on what that might mean? I haven't, I, I've attended a few seminars, but there hasn't been anything concrete that I feel that I've been educated on that they're gonna make any major change. I haven't seen anything in legislation or anything from even the insurance agent, the classes I'm taking, that really is going to impact associations with bringing these rates down. I haven't seen anything concrete yet. Have you, Roxana? And um, the only thing I attended a seminar by an insurance agent. I, try, you know, as we all do in the industry, is try to get educated, you know, by the professionals. And the the one thing I took away is that the the state is trying to make it harder to sue and to. Uh, place claims against insurance companies so that we can attract insurance companies again back into the state to promote competition again. Um, so that that's the only thing, again, nothing concrete to your point, Nicole. Yeah. So it's, we're, we're in a cycle right now of many hurricanes. We had the Champlain Tower South tragedy and it's all kind of compounding over the last two or three years, which is greatly affecting the impact of insurance because it's, it's very, uh, it's been very forthright and, and documented that we've lost, I believe, 12 insurance carriers in the last two years in the state of Florida. So we have fewer and fewer carriers willing to uh, insure all of us that live in Florida. And we all have homes here, just like everybody else. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've seen our personal costs go up for insurance, just like you have in your condos and HOAs. So it's certainly an issue that it would be nice for the state to be able to do something about it, uh, but it may just take time. And over time, the market starts to adjust and kind of moderate itself. Uh, what we forget about is the last, we went from 2005 to 2017 with very little hurricane activity. And so we had 12 years of kind of freebies and insurance decreased significantly over that 12 year period. Now it's come back up and it's actually eclipsed where we were in 2005, but it took a long time to get to those 2005 rates again, but we're there and we're beyond that. So how do we, how do we fund insurance? How do we make ourselves, you know, it's, it's one of those things that's interesting because there's, there's certain costs like when FPL or your utility company comes back and says, you're going to have a 7% increase. You have to pay it. When insurance says you have a $300,000 increase, you have to pay it. Uh, those aren't things you can negotiate. Now, there are ways. And next month, if you'd like to join us on this webinar, we are going to have an insurance expert. And he'll talk about ways to uh, maybe try to moderate some of those costs. And I'm sure you can look at deductibles and just the layering of the insurance programs. And that may be some ways to try to help offset the costs that you're experiencing right now. But I haven't talked to anybody who has a clear-cut path to say this is how we can reduce insurance costs. 
No, I do see some associations being a little proactive in the sense of trying to do some work. So like some of their insurance agents came out and said, well, if you do some work to the roof or you replace it sooner or something that would help the insurance. I don't see it drastically changing the insurance for the cost. It's helping a little, maybe even for the deductibles, but even the deductibles this year, I've seen the deductibles. I haven't seen a 2% in I would say the last 12 months, most of them are going up to four or 5%. So you're seeing that changing also. So associations are starting to try to put that aside. So if something does happen, they have a non-statutory reserve for that. So there's some ideas that way, but it's not drastically increasing the decreasing the insurance that they do all this work. And that's a good point. So I'm going to turn that over to Roxana. And Roxana, as we're creating budgets and the insurance carriers are coming back out and during uh, renewal periods, are insurance companies requiring more projects to be done now? Or are they saying, look, your roof is now, you know, you're beyond that 20 year or 25 year mark. You need to get your roof re replaced. Even if you think it's in good shape, it needs to be replaced in order for us to renew your policy. Are we seeing those kind of requirements from insurance companies? I mean, that's what I heard this morning from the insurance agent that was speaking to us. And one of the things that, um, I took away from that conversation was that impact windows. So some associations are now saying, okay, for this long-term savings and insurance, impact windows may be an answer. And that's what this insurance agent said, that that's what they're seeing now, that they're opting for, we have to do impact windows and moving forward. Um, Ed was asking approximately how many finance companies are out there to help finance insurance premiums? It is. It's what happened. I think uh, it's been a while, but there used to be two main ones. And then I think they acquired one, acquired the other. And so there's one primary one. And then uh, there is also banks. So not every bank will do it, but there are banks with association services. I understand it. And we partner with five out of the five, three do insurance find to have that product to finance insurance. So um there's not many to to the gentleman's point, but there are some options. Yeah, the, not every bank, I agree, does that. Some of them do. Um, they're going to want to look at your audited financial statements too before they're loading that. But um, it's only a, a few that hand few that do that. So uh, we've had some questions about the 115% rule. So Nicole, do you want to address that? Because Teresa is saying, asking, should insurance premiums be included in the budget? If so, most will be 115% over the previous year. What would you suggest? So first thing is the 115%, a lot of people have the misperception that they can't go over the 115%. You can go up to 130%. You can go up to 145%. You just have to allow for an alternative budget. In the 20 well, years, let's life. back that up a little bit. Okay. Explain what that means. What is the 115% sure. rule? So, what they have in the statute is that it's really 115% of the prior year is what they're saying in your operating side only. So, that does not include the reserves. That That is where you are able to go up to in your budget 115% of the prior year in operating. But it doesn't state you can't go higher than that. It's just that if your budget goes over the 115%, you have to allow for an alternative budget that the membership would come to and present. And there's certain guidelines you have to do in order to approve that alternative budget. In the 20 years that I've been doing this, I've never seen an alternative budget. So boards have gone up 115, 120. It does exclude reserves. But now with the new statute, it also excludes insurance. So most associations are not going to go over the 115% of the prior year when they're excluding insurance and reserves, because most of the budgets are due to the insurance increases why they're going over that 115% of the prior year. Roxana, I've seen it once. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I've seen it once and, and literally once in 15 years in the last year, this is wow. what happened. And they did not get enough um, members. Okay. To support the substitute budget. So uh, basically, uh, the, uh, the statute just allows for owners to have a voice if there is an increase of 15%. And it's been 15%, I guess, for 30, 40 years. <laughs> uh, that's never changed. 
but there is a misconception. At least I get a, a couple of questions every budget season uh, about it. So yes, you can increase your operating budget greater than 15% when you're doing that calculation to determine is the increase over 15%, you would take out the reserves you would take out one-time expenses. So if there is a major repair that you're passing through your opera, you would take that out as well. So uh, it's just giving a, the opportunity to someone question the, the budget that the board passed. But when you say you take out insurance, this might get too technical, but let's say my insurance was $300,000 last year and it went up to $600,000 this year. Do I take out all $300,000 from last year and just zero out insurance? Or do I keep my $300,000 and just ignore the $300,000 increase to $600,000? Because if you leave part of the insurance in there, that affects the, what 15% of that total budget is. That right, but you're going to include the whole $600,000 in your budget. So right. I would think that you're just not going to, you're going to exclude that six hundred dollars because that would put you over the 115%. Okay, thank you. Um, so Roxana on, on insurance this year, what, so last year we saw about a 33% increase across the board. I, and I know we're, we're hearing, um, from an HOA standpoint, what are HOAs experiencing? Because most of what we're talking about is condos. HOAs aren't typically seeing the same big levels of increase. So to show a little love to our HOA brethren <laughs> on this call. Let's uh, give them a little bit of uh, input. Yeah, their here. insurance also went up higher than in the normal. Um, we also saw some go up uh, the two digits, like 10, maybe 12%. So there's still a, a, an effect, an increase effect to even HOAs. Not at the level of condos, but there's still an effect to them because insurance, even what we were talking about personally, I know I got a bill <laughs> um, twice actually <laughs> in the last year that increased insurance. So yeah, HOAs are still affected, but not at the level that the condominiums are. Okay. Nicole, what are you seeing with HOAs? Are you having a different conversation with them than you do a condo. Yeah, HOA world is definitely very different than condo world, especially in the budget arena, because they don't have as much to insure unless they have a lot of amenities like, you know, a tiki, a restaurant, a clubhouse. Most of them don't have as much to insure. So that hasn't been impacted as much. I haven't seen the HOA maintenance fees go up as drastically as condo world because they don't have the Sears requirement. And some of them have non-statutory reserves which are just board reserves. So they're not mandated to be funded the way condominium world is. Okay, great, thank you. So here's a question from Joe in Estero. He's asking, uh, how does an association move surplus funds into the new budget to help lower uh, maintenance fees? So Roxanne, I'll let you topic. take that one. Well, <laughs> When you have excess funds, and for us, excess funds, and, and mind you, the statute doesn't define what excess funds are, what surplus is, or what even a deficit is. But what we defined it as is that you have excess funds over and above two months of operating expenses. So we keep uh, two months of operating expenses in cash, let's say, in your cash surplus so that uh, you have the funds for unexpected expenses, such as a hurricane and, and the cleanup that may come aftermath of a hurricane. Uh, so the excess over that, we always recommend give it back to the owners in the form of an improvement. So dollar for dollar, what you put into an operating budget, you would have a, a matching line of a special project or a capital improvement in your operating budget. We don't recommend giving it back as a credit. So when you put it into other income and you say prior year surplus and literally you're giving your owners a credit, you may be doing a yo-yo effect. So you're giving back a percentage point back to the owner. The next year, that number, that excess is gone because you literally uh, are taking from your surplus to pay your landscaper, to pay for payroll, to pay your services. Next year, that's gone. 
So what are you going to do to the owner as costs go up? You're going to not only increase their budget, the extra few percentage points, but also recover that 1% you just gave them back last year. So that yo-yo effect is not, um, it's not recommended one to the owner so that they know that the step up, there's always a step up. Even in years past before insurance was a conversation, before reserves was a conversation, there was inflation and all contracts, most contracts have some um, increase. And if it, it doesn't happen one year, it would happen the next year. So the increase was still somewhere between three and five. So there's always an increase every year. So um, to us, surpluses, you should retain what you can. Um, two months uh, is our recommendation. I would agree with you. So too many associations ask that question because there's some things in the statute that say it can be refunded to the owners. Refund can be in the form of putting it into reserves, like you stated, for future projects. Left an operating surplus for future operating expenses, like an emergency situation. And the other side is to the board members, if you refunded it, then these owners get this back. And then when you need the money and then you have to special assess, you look bad. You look bad to them. Then why don't we just keep it in the equity and then use it? And then you don't have to special assess. So it's better that you keep it in the association for those future projects. Well, we won't get into this, but when you start refunding dollars to owners, who gets that refund, the current owner or the person who actually contributed? And that becomes very messy trying to find people. You know, it's, it's just difficult. So uh, we won't we won't talk about that because it's really I've only seen that happen once or twice. It's not very often that happens. No, it's not. So uh, another question came up, Roxanne, I'll ask you, uh, Marsha in uh, Daytona Beach is saying that we're experiencing delinquencies, which we've never, that we never really have occurred before in our condo. So how do we budget for these? Uh, and, um, you know, how do we, you're trying to manage around possible foreclosure. So how do, are we seeing more of an increase in uh, bad debt these days? And uh, how is that being managed through the budget process? So um, delinquency went down in the last four to five years. It's, it, it's uh, not been a worry like in 2008, where there was a lot of uh, inventory, um, a lot of vacant condominiums, and there was a different um, aspect, a, a large impact to the operating budget through the bad debt. So how do you budget for those that are not paying is through the bad debt expense line. And we do a calculation, we analyze the um owners that are not paying, but then we add a little bit because we, with these increases, we know that there could be another uh, set of owners that we don't even know yet are not gonna pay the next year's budget. So we do try to increase that. I think that we're, you know, as increases are in two digits, last year an average of 20% this year with insurance going up. We don't know what the owner's breaking point is, and we have to estimate. So a lot of the budget lines are estimates. So we have to estimate what could be in the future. So we're definitely tracking um, receivables and the trend. And what I've seen is that there's more late payers than last year. Not that they become delinquent two months or three months. They're just paying later. So they're not paying at the beginning of the month, they're paying, they're incurring late fees and then paying at the end. So that percentage has gone up, but ultimately overall owners are paying their assessments that we're still in the one to 2% delinquency rate for associations. But I just see um, late payments more often now. Yeah, from so the then you don't know what the owner's breaking point is. You know that that's why we're tracking bad debt so closely. That's an excellent point that you're making, and it's good to know that too from an audit perspective because mm -hmm. we're not seeing that either. We're not seeing a real increase in the bad debts, but we are talking in the industry that we feel in the next couple of years we will see a little bit of an increase in that due to this new Sears. Are there going to be people that aren't going to be able to afford it? Is there going to be a higher increase in foreclosures in the condominium world? 
Um, uh, one more question from our audience, and then we'll wrap things up because we're getting close to the top of the hour. This is from Teresa. Uh, would membership voting be required if the board decided to transfer surplus funds to a reserve account? So it does not require a membership vote. Leftover surplus is a board's decision to move over to the reserves. I would document it in the minutes. I always recommend that, anything that you make a business decision, but it is not a membership vote. Okay, excellent. So with that, I mean, there's still a lot of questions out there, but I think we answered, uh, the, well, I'll ask one more because this is a little bit different from John. He's asking, um, Nicole, I'll throw this at you. Is, is there any type of landscaping reserve eligible versus having it an operating expense? So from an HOA side, if you're non-statutory, you can have really anything in your reserves because it's non-statutory. From condominium world, that's not really considered capital landscaping. Landscaping wouldn't be considered statutory reserves. Uh, we would question it from an audit standpoint because landscaping is not considered capital. I know boards will tell me, well, it'll last five or six years, but it's not considered capital from a reserve standpoint, from the audit perspective. So it would really be in the operating side of your budget. But if you had a, a hurricane reserve or hurricane cleanup reserve, a lot of that, could you use that for uh, landscape replacement? Because a lot of landscaping gets damaged during the process. That's a great point. You could have that. That's still a non-statutory reserve. So it wouldn't be where it's restricted. If a new board came on, they could spend it for operating because it's not a restrictive reserve. Okay. So uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, another quick hour. Uh, and hopefully this helped clarify a lot of the open issues that we didn't get to last week. So I will, uh, I'll start with uh, you, Nicole. Last question, what is your, uh, and Roxana, you're gonna get the next question so you get the benefit of thinking for 30 seconds. Yeah. Uh, what, what is the best uh, advice you could give a board member to prepare a, a good budget, uh, the right budget for their association, knowing all these changing laws and the, the increases in insurance and SERS, reserves, uh, moving into 2024 and beyond all the way to 2025, because I think this really needs to be a two or three year outlook this year when you're putting your reserve together. So what are what best practice would you recommend? I think I tell my boards this all the time and I kind of repeat it over and over that they need to think about this. This is a business. It's like your own household. If you had a business, would you ever not fund what you needed to, to make that business successful? Would you not put the funds in that are needed for future things? Just like your own home life. Would you not do things to make sure your own home is sustainable? So making sure that you're budgeting enough and making sure that you're getting ahead of the curve for this Sears, that the unit owners are all protected, that you're in compliance with statutes, and that you're funding enough that that association is financially stable. All right. And Roxana, what do you, uh, you probably do this every day. What is the recommendation <laughs> that you make for best practices for many of our clients as you help with them? Help start them early. Them? If you haven't started, please start now. Call your professionals. You know, in a management company like KW, the professionals are part of your team. So your manager is calling me, calling the district manager. We have a layer of professionals here that can help. We all have our different strengths. This is the time not to just throw caution to the wind. You need to bring in your professionals to give you advice and insurance. That's your insurance agent. Financial condition, that's where we come in. And um, on the reserves, your reserve study specialist and your engineer. Um, to uh, to your point, Nicole, what do you need to do from now to the next two, three years? You do need to be mindful there's going to be an increase to reserve contribution. Start doing it now. You don't need the reserve study to really, or the structural reserve study in your hands to just add money to your reserves. There's never enough funds that can go into reserves. There's a calculation. It gives you a number, but you could always increase that number. Do that now um, and increase your uh, budget on professional fees because you are going to have to navigate. As we talked, we, we're not attorneys. We rely on the attorneys for clarifications of a very complicated bill and a very complicated statute that has passed because we all have questions still. So increase legal fees, increase 
uh, professional fees to engineers, for example. So. Okay. R Nicole, did you have another comment on that? You look like you had something else that you might no, want. No, everything she said, I'm absolutely agreeing with. I'm like, you need to listen to those professionals. They do it every day. They know what they're talking about. Professional just like you, right, Nicole? Yes. <laughs> So, uh, well, I think we, we've gotten to the top of the hour. It's four o'clock. So uh, thank you both for another great session. Uh, hopefully these uh, last week and this week combined, our folks can listen to it. If you registered and couldn't attend or if you registered and missed some of the session today, you will get a recorded session by tomorrow because we record these and we send out the recorded session to everybody that uh, participated or wasn't able to. Uh, we gotten a lot of comments today about can I get the recorded session? So yes, you will. Um, thank you again to Nicole Johnson, the Director of Operations of Hafer CPAs, and Roxana Dorigo, Executive Director and a CPA and a partner with KW Property Management. So on behalf of all of us from KW, uh, we wish you uh, a very good week. For those of you suffering the re results of the hurricane, we wish you a quick recovery. Um, and uh, we only ask that you all be kind to your neighbors. Thank you so much for another great session. And we'll come back in September and talk more about how we can control insurance costs potentially with an attorney and one of the insurance experts from Brown and Brown. Thank you all. Have a great day.